Providing these newspapers with reporting no single independent enterprise could afford is the Associated Negro Press, international in scope, its headquarters in Chicago, the nerve center for a network of correspondence in every American and foreign news center. It's an invaluable central source of news to supplement local coverage, airmailing its bulletins to subscribing newspapers everywhere in the country. Founder and head of the Associated Negro Press is Claude Barnett, well known for his public service, which has included government work and a position on Tuskegee's board of directors. Among the AMP correspondents is fashion editor Mrs. Freddie Henderson, shown visiting the United Nations gift shop. She's also president of the National Association of Fashion Designers. Hollywood correspondent Harry Levatt interviews top personalities such as radio and movie star Ruby Dandridge to keep the thousands who follow his column posted. Gladys Graham covers New York. She's as familiar a figure among New York's downtown municipal buildings as in Harlem. In the United Nations, Samuel Perry follows the workings of international diplomacy in close contact with figures of global importance. In Washington, D.C., Mrs. Alice Dunnigan is among the bare handful of women who are accredited White House correspondents. One of several African correspondents is Bankhole Timothy of Gold Coast, shown here with Premier Kwame Nkrumah. London Representative Sam Morris divides his time between Parliament and the British Columbia office. Welcome to episode five of De Facto. I'm Anthony Ballas. I'm once again joined by Dr. Gerald Horn, who holds the John J. and Rebecca Morris Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston, author of around 40 books, including his latest book, uh, Counter Revolution of 1836 Texas and uh, Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, which Dr. Horn and I discussed a few months ago. You can find that on YouTube. Dr. Horn was also the recent recipient of the Caribbean Ph Philosophical Association's Franz Fanon Lifetime Achievement Award for his work. Uh, Dr. Horn, thank you for joining me again and congratulations on this uh, wonderful achievement. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. So I, I know you've been out in California conducting research. It looks like you might be back in Texas right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wondered if we could check in and see uh, how your project's coming along, if you could give us a, a little bit of an update. Yeah, so uh, I was in California for two months, beginning in early November to the last day in December. And primarily, I was working on this book on uh, Panthers, Communists, and Black Nationalism of Southern California. And I'm going back to California, actually tomorrow, uh, February 5th. And it'll be there likely till the end of March. This time I'll be heading to Northern California as well. And also uh, while I was in California, the end of 2022, I was doing research on this book on Northeast Africa. U.S. and Northeast Africa. Uh, so, at the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, they have this real problem uh, because after they leave London, set up this independent state, then they have to fend for themselves in terms of the North African pirates, so-called, who are enslaving Euro-Americans. And so it's a very tricky question for the early United States not least and because it was widely thought that in Algiers, which was from the US point of view, the major perpetrator, that the Jewish community in Algiers thought the United States was behind this. So thought the United States. So I'm trying to, 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 
to broaden the, the story in terms of this famed speech by George Washington in Newport, Rhode Island, where he offers overtures to the Jewish community in the United States. And I'm trying to connect these disparate elements. In other, in other words, uh, he was concerned, as, all, as, as most of the Euro-American leadership was concerned. Although, of course, they they never seem to connect <laughs> the enslavement, enslavement of these Euro-Americans <laughs> to the enslavement they were perpetrating in North America. That somehow that didn't dawn. It, it, it's really fascinating. So that's so, and and actually, that that project is still taking shape, unlike the prior one, because even though, as noted, I'm dealing with the late 18th, early 19th century. I may go into the 20th century, but because you know the, the Panama Canal is built, which has major geopolitical consequence post US Civil War. I'm trying to deal with Ethiopia or Abyssinia and its attempts to stay independent. And this assistance from Russia, by the way, in the 1890s when it repels an Italian invasion. So this is sort of a sprawling project. I'm, uh, uh, it's still taking shape. I'm, I'm I'm not sure what the final product will look like, or if I'll have to engage in some serious surgery. <laughs> so you know, we'll see. And then uh, I'm, I'm doing this project on, uh, and, and actually, that a lot of that work was done at the Huntington Library, which your scholarly audience should familiarize themselves with. It's a great library. That's in just Northern outside, California. Just outside of Pasadena. Okay. LA County. Um, I've been working there for years and it's an independent library set up by Robert Barron. And uh, it's it's also a combination archive, library, art museum, botanical gardens. Oh, wow. So it's a very pleasant place to work because they have all these unique uh, species of plants. Oh yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And then I'm doing this project project on Southeast Asia, which is really in its infancy. Um, it's, 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 it appears that a lot of it will have to do with the Philippines. Uh, not least because, you know, I, I'm tracking the role of the United States and that's where its role is the most intense, to put it mildly. But it, it's still taking shape. I can't even share with you and your audience uh, any any startling revelations so far. So um, that, that's, I think that's all I'm working Oh, yeah, then I'm doing this book on D.C. slavery, Washington slavery right. in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I'll be doing some traveling uh, this spring and summer about that. But anyway, I know we need to talk about something else. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, we appreciate the update. Uh, we're, fast we're always fascinated to hear about your research, and, uh, and it's always nice to have something to anticipate, right? Uh, yeah, when I agree. projects come out, so mm -hmm. uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, but today we, we wanted to talk about the rise and fall of the Associated Negro Press, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Claude Barnett's Pan-African News and the Jim Crow Paradox. This was uh, put out by the University of Illinois in 2017. But Dr. Horn, before we discuss Claude Barnett, let's discuss some of these recent attacks on your work. Oh, my <laughs> um, which are coming from these uh, people who say they're on the left, call themselves communists, maybe they call themselves patriotic socialists, or I don't know what to call them at, po at this point. I think maybe you would call them left-wing white nationalists, so maybe we can just use that term. Uh, <laughs> I know that, now, just a disclaimer, I know you were pressed probably about a year ago, maybe a little more, on a different podcast called, uh, I think, Bad Faith, on this question of patriotism mm. and the left. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I want to assure you that I, I'm not going to press you incessantly on this question. Um, <laughs> but I do want to recount some of the recent accusations about your work on this kind of patriotic socialist camp or whatever they call themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they it seems to me like they're really attacking not only your work, but your character. <laughs> 
your motives behind a lot of your work. They call into question your credibility as a historian and as a scholar, as a, as a political analyst. They, they call into question your research methods and so on. So I just wanted to point out some of the, the, the major points launched against you. Um, and then you can respond. A lot of this is going to be direct quotation from some of the stuff, but I'm not going to cite these guys because I don't want to give them any clout here. But mm -hmm. uh, you've been accused of promoting a distorted view of liberation theory. You've been called a popular liberal historian whose work is incompatible with historical materialism. You apparently perpetuate a grift and omission and obfuscation of class struggle, and the question of class is forbidden in your analysis. You've been accused of being in bed with the Democratic Party, and pushing a woke cultural revolution, direct quote, shoulder to shoulder with the ruling elites. Uh, you've been called a race essentialist, a race reductionist, which is an accusation that to my ears echoes and pairs alarmingly well with some of the language found in Sarah Huckabee Sanders' recent executive order in Arkansas uh, last week or so, which maybe we can talk a little bit about in a minute. Uh, your, and finally, your work on the counter-revolution of 1776 has been described as an apologia for the British Empire. So essentially, you've been called a, a royalist, in other words. And you've been accused of, quote, exaggerating the contradictions of the founding fathers. Dr. Horn, are these people reading the same books that, that I've read, and that many of our listeners have read? And are these the same books you wrote? Did, did they even read these books? Could you please respond and, and help us make sense of some of these convoluted and outrageous accusations? Well, uh, let me say to begin with, that with regard to monarchists and royalists, the so-called patriots would not have prevailed in the late 18th century, but for the assistance of the French ruling class and the French king. And they spent so heavily that it led directly to the Haitian Revolution. So perhaps these alleged critics and detractors are apologists for now defunct French royalist elite, which points to an, another question. I'm not sure if folks have been keeping up with the literature. Uh, it would be as if you're teaching biology and you don't want to deal with the uncovering of DNA. And, and in other words, supposedly, uh, we try to do history in a scientific way, which means that oftentimes there are newer discoveries and revelations. And it would be as if you're teaching biology and you don't want to deal with the uncovering of D DNA in the early 1950s because it doesn't fit your theory of the case. And as I pointed out previously, with regard to keeping up with the literature, the, the, the literature ha has grown by leaps and bounds since the 1960s, when I, it appears that some of these critics uh, began to become conversant with these themes. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the prize-winning book by Alan Taylor of the University of Virginia, The Internal Enemy, the internal enemy being Black people. <laughs> basically. And as is well known, uh, the similarly notorious 1619 project <laughs> drew in part from my work and the previous critics of the 1619 project, if you look at the Washington Post in the last few days, they're suing for peace or perhaps one of truths. Uh, for example. And of course, the, the idea of the 1619 project was that in look methods meted out to Black people in this country, it's a derivative of slavery and Jim Crow. Now, of course, there's a tendency in U.S. history to look at history as a thing apart and not try to connect it to the present. As I explained at once, is if you go to a doctor, and of course a doctor takes a medical history, wanting to know the maladies of your parents, grandparents, et cetera, and then you ask the doctor why, and the doctor says, oh, I'm an antiquarian. This has nothing to do with your case at hand. I'm just interested in history for history's sake. 
And we're trying to understand how we got to this point, how we got to Memphis, for example, how we got to Sandra Bland. And I would hope and think the people on the left would be concerned about this sort of thing. And if they don't want to connect it to the history as some of us have tried to do, well, they should come up with another thesis. I mean, if you don't like, as opposed to just uh, counterpunching and not coming to the aid and defense of this besieged community. Now, with regard to the class question, what's interesting about that is that, as I've explained ad nauseum, the enslaved were an unpaid segment of the working class. And so it's the other side that's not looking at the class question because what's striking is that this unpaid segment of the working class, one would think that people on the left would celebrate their revolts, their uprisings, which is what I tried to do, their attempt to break the chains of repression. But I guess that conflicts with the very notion of settler colonialism, which involves class collaboration. So I pointed it out in my 16th century book. I'm not sure if these folks have read anything that I've I don't even know if they wrote read the 1776 book, but apparently they haven't read the 16th century book and the 17th century book, uh, which deals with the origins of the United States on a class collaborationist basis, the initial settlement in what is called North Carolina in the 1580s, involving uh, Europeans of different class backgrounds and sponsored by the 1%, how that contributes to a kind of reconciliation between those warring on the shores of Europe, English versus Irish, Protestant versus Catholic, Catholic versus uh, Jewish, Christian versus Jewish, Britain, British versus German, you know, constructing this new identity politics of whiteness. So, and with regard to this, this question of wokeness, I, I mean, what, what is this, Governor DeSantis language? I mean, uh, yeah. The, the whole that whole concept, among other things, is, is really a way to discredit anti anti racism, mm -hmm. L like Governor DeSantis is trying to circumscribe the teaching of Black American history. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're staring down the barrel of fascism right now, and I would hope that those who are intelligent and literate would try to develop an understanding of why that might be so, particularly since that is in concert with the contrasting idea that this grand republic was constructed in the late 18th century. And what about the Native American question? I mean, I've noticed that that question is oftentimes sort of swept under the rug uh, for whatever reason. I guess it's harder to rationalize. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure why. I mean, what about the Second Amendment, which is the juridical basis for the proliferation of weapons? And it's apparent that this late 18th century proviso was designed to create militias of settlers so that they could further repress revolts of the indigenous and the Africans. Now, on the other side of the equation, I think that there is this longing and yearning in this country for all of us to be on the same page uh, to confront the US ruling class, which is a grand idea, but there might be a reason why in 1991 in Louisiana, 55% of the Euro-American population voted to cross class lines for a Nazi for to like to prevent that from taking place. There Sorry, might be a you reason. Just, you just broke up a little bit. Um, you're, you're speaking of 1991 in Louisiana. That's David Duke, right? David Duke, absolutely. Or in neighboring Louisiana, why Euro-Americans vote across class lines for the right nine to one. Now, if you, if you look at some of our uh, analysts, you would think that the re it's, it's like a column by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times the other day. Uh, 
where he said all, all, all of this so-called woke language is alienating the right, alienating the Euro-Americans and causing them to vote for the right. So <laughs> I guess we have to jump this idea of having selection of pronouns. We have to uh, jump the term Latinx because the white people get so upset. <laughs> you know, they, they freak out and go out and vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> you know, I mean, so a lot of this is just sort of elaborate excuses for backwardness as opposed to looking backwardness in the face or it's a way to, it, 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 it's it's you have a reality and then you have a theory of the case and the theory of the case doesn't necessarily fit reality so you jump reality and stick with your theory <laughs> The theory being people like me or racist centralists, even though I'm the one who's done labor history, wrote a book called Class Struggle in Hollywood, uh, dealing with the class forces there. Uh, I'm the one who wrote a book on Caribbean labor history, uh, for example. So I, I, I think what it is, is that it's difficult for some to deal with a black critic of the left, of the status quo. They have to turn them into a nation of Islam cadre. <laughs> That's the way they can deal with them. Um, I, actually, I remember I, I was doing an interview <laughs> with uh, Matt Taibbi, who is now prominent for the Twitter files. And so I was suggesting that this left-wing white nationalism was really just a recruiting broadside for the Nation of Islam. And why did I say that? Because that meant that I was an apologist for the Nation of Islam. That gave him something to, to bite, dig his teeth into. You know, ah, another race essentialist <laughs> you know, can be dismissed. <laughs> so, you know, th th this country's in trouble. And... and uh, I've probably spoken too long on this subject in any case. Well, uh, you you brought up this rise of fascism, which you and I have talked about uh, at great length on on this podcast. Um, you mentioned Memphis, the the um, lynching of Tyree Nichols recently, and you know there's a uh, you, you mentioned Ron DeSantis, of course, and the echoing of this language in the in uh, the Florida Board of Education's ruling on this AP um, African-American studies, African-American histories course. And, and I mentioned um, Arkansas and Sarah Huckabee Sanders executive order against um, so-called crit uh, critical race theory. And I, I noticed those echoes of that language also um, just briefly in that, in that executive order, she describes, uh, it's described that uh, critical race theorists are essentially race, race essentialists who elevate race as the primary characteristic, I think I'm quoting directly, of uh, people. And furthermore, stating that America, you know, this is against American values of, of, uh, of freedom and neutrality. And I thought that language was striking in its counterfactual portrayal of not only the United States, but this idea that anyone examining race is, is, a, seg is a new segregationist. It's a really striking, um, but the, the serious question here is how can the left unify against, and we oh, the anti, the, uh, um, the resolution denouncing social, the horrors of socialism a couple oh, of days ago right. in the house. How, how can the left unify against this anti-socialist sentiment, this widespread anti-communism, the rise of fascism, the continuation of fascist state violence? I mean, um, failed Republican candidate in, I believe it was New Mexico, plotting the assassination of his political rivals. A, a councilwoman in New Jersey was just gunned down in front of her home a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. how, how can we understand what's going on today without an understanding of the anti-Black and settler colonial historical roots and ideological roots in this country, and I know you, your work addresses that so much, but if you'd like to speak to that now, please do. Well, 
first of all, with regard to the to the previous point, I think fortunately, uh, some of these so-called critics are in a minority. I mean, uh, and it wouldn't be far-fetched to call them Euro-American critics because the black community is hungry for an explanation that sheds light on why so many of us are not only scared to go outside, but afraid that even if you're inside, the police might come and knock down the door as what happened with Bri Breonna Taylor in, in Kentucky, for example, and make waste of you. So on the one hand, I don't think that we should make too much of some of these so-called left-wing trends because if you look historically, uh, you know, I did that huge book on Southern Africa. I mean, you had uh, similar trends in Southern Africa, and of course they got left by the wayside or, and are still by the wayside. Uh, on the other hand, with regard to the United States, I think in the interest of time, let me just say that a sweeping antidote to this malady is seeking to internationalize our struggle at every opportunity to bring in fresh currents uh, from outside of the borders of the former slaveholders republic because the correlation of forces in the united states right now is not very promising shall we say and i think that with regard to the black community in particular, the, that, that's something that's part of the folklore almost. That is to say that what has been our saving grace has been the Haitian revolution, uh, the development of a socialist camp and liberation movements in Africa and the Caribbean and how that impels the United States to, to make halting steps away from the more egregious aspects of US Jim Crow. And in this Black community, which, as I said, has a legacy of class struggle, even though typically it's oftentimes mischaracterized as put identity politics, <laughs> there is this desire and hunger for internationalizing the struggle. And hopefully, uh, by being 13% of the uh, population and heavily working class, uh, that can serve to influence the latter in particular, that is to say the working class in particular, and would have positive knock-on effects as well in terms of uh, perhaps eroding, if not dispensing with altogether the blockade against Cuba, uh, the sanctions regimes against various countries too numerous to mention, et cetera, in particular in light of the fact that there is obviously a, a changing global correlation of forces with the rise of China, with the five a four star general saying the United States and China would be at war by 2025, the whole balloonacy <laughs> that's now taking place as we speak. Um, so, so I, I, I think that there are possible way, ways out, and uh, I'm optimistic that these ways out will be pursued. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, and for spending so much time on this question. Um, uh, regarding the, the the criticism of your work, and it's a good. Speaking of internationalism, it's kind of a good segue into talking about the rise and fall of the Associated Negro Press, the ANP, because um, there's kind of a global context in which this news agency, Claude Barnett, started this news agency and what it became. Um, so you you write that the purpose of this book is to recollect the largely forgotten history of Barnett and the AMP, Associated Negro Press, and restore both a well-deserved place in the anti-Jim Crow and Pan-African pantheon. And you continue by saying that Barnett was uh, maybe the most important unrecognized African-American of the 20th century, and the legacy he built with the AMP was surely one of the most important institutions of that era. Dr. Horn, who was Claude Barnett, and uh, why was he such an important figure despite the as you put it, ephemeral nature of his celebrity. Well, Claude Burnett, as you suggested, was a founder of the Associated Negro Press, which comes to existence about a century ago, fades out of existence by the late 1960s. Uh, 
But during that era, uh, it was a major disseminator and dispenser of news to the Negro press, uh, which was and still is to a degree. I still read the Black press and still am informed by it. Uh, it helped to shape uh, Black public opinion, the Black public sphere. He had uh, correspondence worldwide. Duke Ellington's band, Duke Ellington being the major composer, uh, pianist, uh, conductor, and went abroad, oftentimes a, a member of his entourage uh, of the band would file stories. Uh, he tried to hire Richard Wright, the black novelist, or Neil Hurston, the folklorist and, and novelist. And I, I'll never. And I should also say that the collection of his papers and the A and P papers, which are at the Chicago Historical Society, but also on microfilm, at least most of it's on microfilm, which means it's available worldwide, is is really one of the richest archives of Black America, along with NAACP papers, Du Bois papers. Now, of course, those latter two are well known. The A and P collection is not as well known. I never forget when I was doing research for this book in Chicago, going through the papers, I run across a, a dispatch from Germany in May 1945, written on Hitler's stationery. Hmm. They, they had a correspondent who penetrated the bunker and, and scribbled a story and sent it back to Chicago. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of uh, coverage and reach that the AMP had. And if, I should also say that this collection also informed this little book, well, little compared to some of the other big books that I've done on Blacks and aviation, because Chicago was and still is sort of a lodestar for the Black community, and certainly was a lodestar in terms of aviation. This book, Storming the Heavens, deals with Black people in aviation because Black people in the United States were very much concerned with aviation because they were always trying to figure out a way to get out of this place. And uh, Claude Burnett was very much concerned with aviation. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the Storming the Heavens book begins with an, a vignette from East Africa because I, th I think the, the guy's name was John Robinson. He was black from Dixie, who migrates to Chicago, learns to fly, and then uh, becomes the leader of the Air Force in Ethiopia, having dogfights in the air with the Italian invaders in the 1930s, and then goes on to play a leading role in the founding of Ethiopian Airways, which is still the leading carrier on the continent. Um, so the problem, of course, with Barnett was that his class interests oftentimes got in the way of any kind of uh, progressive sentiment. I mean, for example, I quote a letter that he writes to the Belgian colonists. I believe it's in the 1950s in the Congo. And um, as is well known, through the work of Joseph Conrad and others. I mean, the Congo was turned into a charnel house by the Belgian colonizers. In fact, there are these stories all over the press now about uh, how just recently the Congo returned the remains of Patrice Lumumba, the founding father, who was assassinated January 1961 with the assistance of the US CIA and then his body is apparently burned in a vat of chemicals. So what they return is a gold tooth. It's put in a huge casket and returned only in the last few weeks to the Congo. There was a big story in the Financial Times of London about that a few ago. So Garnett is writing a letter to the Congolese authorities complaining, as well he should, about depredations committed against the Africans. But then midway in the letter, he makes an inquiry about buying uh, Congolese artifacts. 
for his own collection, which I understand was eventually turned over to uh, Tuskegee because he was a devoted son of Tuskegee, the now university constructed by Booker T. Washington uh, some decades ago. And so it's that sort of conflict of interest uh, that inheres in his class background in a sense, because he was not only uh, trying to spread the news, but he was an entrepreneur. And that brings us, of course, to the 1950s when the United States begins this agonizing retreat away from the horrors of Jim Crow. Uh, theretofore, uh, Barnett had a kind of monopoly stranglehold over Black writers and Black journalists because they wouldn't, New York Times, none of these places would hire these Black people. But then with the uh, onset of desegregation, his monopoly stranglehold was loosened and the bourgeois press, the mainstream press decides the better part of wisdom is to try to cover the black community journalistically because they're concerned about left-wing inroads into the black community. The heroes were people like Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Claudia Jones. And that fateful turn, uh, has impact on Claude Burnett's enterprise. So then he tries to expand into Africa, but then African nations are coming to independence. They have an ambition to set up journalistic enterprises all their own. Understandably, they're a little suspicious of Burnett given his US origins and given the deviltry committed by the US in Africa, uh, reference the aforementioned note concerning Patrice Lumumba, for example. And then once again, uh, Barnett is sort of compromised uh, ethically in the sense that at, at the same time, he's reaching out to these West African nations on the journalistic plane. He's trying to knock together various investment syndicates to exploit their natural resources. And that does not go down very well uh, amongst African leaders, many of whom are very sophisticated politically, speaking of Seiko Toure, of Guinea Conakry, and Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Modibo Keita, the founding father of today's Mali. So interestingly enough, the, there's sort of a paradox in the sense that He's campaigning for anti-colonialism. He's campaigning against Jim Crow. But when those ambitious goals are reached to a degree, he finds himself in a different political situation that he does not know how to handle. That oftentimes happens, of course. Uh, people get overtaken by events. Uh, as is well known in revolutionary processes, uh, there are those who are quite adroit and adept in tumbling the old order, destabilizing the old order, but are not adroit and adept in building the new order. I mean, that, that, that happens all the time. You see it in many countries. Uh, so in, in, in some, that's the story of Claude Burnett and the Associated Negro Press. Uh, um... It's interesting how you how you characterize him. And by the way, John Robinson does appear um, briefly mm -hmm. in this book, um, mm -hmm. The Aviator. Um, it's interesting how you characterize Barnett and the ANP as this sprawling news agency that had its hands um, <clears throat> in in uh, political movements, that had a stake in political movements like anti-colonialism, but it, it, it reached an entrepreneurial limit, maybe as as you're describing. You describe. Mm -hmm. um, Barnett as uh, living a contradictory existence. And at, at one point you characterize him as um, trying to ride two horses going in opposite directions, uh, leading to the, the fall of the AMP. I wonder mm -hmm. if, if I could ask, um, could, could you give us a little bit of the history of the black press before mm -hmm. uh, the rise of the AMP? Because this was uh, kind of an unprecedented rise, Clyde, Clyde Barnett's AMP. 
I, I have a little familiarity with the Freedman's Journal because you mm -hmm. wrote about it in uh, in your Haitian book, your book on Haiti, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, first black owned newspaper in the United States. Can, can you give us kind of a brief overview of this history leading up to uh, Barnett? So Freedom's Journal starts in 1827. Um, and the man who helps to ignite it, John Russworm, uh, has roots in the United States, Caribbean, and also Canada. Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. And, and just as a footnote, we, we need someone who is conversant in French to do a study of Black Americans in Quebec. I, I think that there will be much to be uncovered. I mean, I might have added to the list of my projects, but right now, that, that seems to be beyond my grasp, but somebody needs to do it. So you have Freedom's Journal, and as noted, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken in this first issue, it says that it's important for Black people to tell their own story. And the way I interpret that is that the unpaid working class oftentimes has interests that are contrary to the interests of the nation. I know that's difficult for, for some people to accept because they would like to see us all on the same page, but Oftentimes there are distinct interests that the unpaid working class has. And, and one, of course, is the Haitian Revolution. And I'm afraid to say that uh, the hero of 1776 on the left, Tom Paine, had little to say about the Haitian Revolution, although one would think that the establishing of this republic in the Caribbean would attract his dedicated attention. And, and, and other luminaries of the period also will, will go unnamed had little to say about the Haitian Revolution or certainly little to say positive. And so uh, this illustrates the need for the Black press to defend this uh, fledgling revolution whose ripples spread throughout the uh, hemisphere. Uh, but by the way, I, I, you know, I, I do these interviews on KPFK Pacifica. And so I just did this interview with uh, George Reed Andrews of the University of Pittsburgh, who wrote this book, Afro-Latin America. And among other things, he deals with the repercussions of the Haitian Revolution on slavery, on Simon Bolivar, on Jose San Martin, uh, throughout the hemisphere, as far south as Tierra, Tierra del Fuego in Argentina. And so, and then in my Haitian book, if I'm not mistaken, I talk about the impact on um, with the abolition of slavery, you have the growth of unions of working class people, the struggle for an eight hour day, uh, for example. And so it's important that you have this black press historically and in the contemporary sense. Now, interestingly enough, some of the black churches as well, the AME church, they have their own organs, press organs as well which are, are, are rich sources for the study of slavery, co-slavery. The black press is a rich source for the study of the US intervention in the Philippines, for example. I, I know that already from my study on Southeast Asia. It's uh, a major player in the politics of New York City, the New York Amsterdam News, which is still in existence. If you look at Los Angeles, for example, you have today's Los Angeles Sentinel, uh, but before that there was the California Eagle. Uh, its editor and publisher, Charlotta Bass, uh, was on the Progressive Party presidential ticket as vice presidential candidate in 1952. It's sort of a swan song for national organized left politics on a mass basis, for example. Recall that Henry Wallace had captained the ticket in 1948, former vice president under FDR, uh, former cabinet member under Truman before running afoul because of his reluctance to turn his back on the left social forces uh, nationally and domestically. 
if you look at uh, Muhammad Speaks, the organ of the Nation of Islam, for example, uh, if you, what's interesting about somebody needs to write about this, the, the, the Nation of Islam newspaper, the editors and journalists are oftentimes from the left. Interest. That's why the, the, the international coverage is so strong. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll admit this, although I'm sure it'll be um, mangled in translation. Uh, I used to write articles before the Muhammad Speaks. Now, of course, that'll get me dubbed and <laughs> race essentialist. <laughs> but I was writing about Latin American politics uh, and the rise of the left in Latin America. And... Um, so, so, so that there's a, a, a glorious history uh, of the black press in the United States. It served a very prominent role. Fortunately, it's now being digitized. It's been on microfilm for years now and has been a rich source for scholars and researchers for years and, and, and still is. Uh, the Chicago Defender, for example, uh, played a role in terms of encouraging black people to flee the horrors of Dixie, for example. Um, and of course, the uh, black press, uh, I should mention uh, Marcus Garvey's newspaper, Negro World, which was banned in many colonies because the idea, the very idea of black sovereignty and self-assertion was seen as inimical to colonialism. For example, uh, Negro World had impact in Kenya had impact in Southern Africa. So the, this, this US black press, as I said, has played a very preeminent, preeminent and prominent role. And yeah, thanks for filling us in on that history uh, and the importance of the black press and its global reach, which is uh, something that I think it's often overlooked um, and the aspirations to become global, uh, Claude Barnett's uh, aspirations to, to do that, um, not least. You describe his uh, brand of Pan-Africanism as a, a unique brand. Does this have something to do with those limitations? Oh, of course. On some of his politics? Okay. And uh, of course. so it, this Jim Crow paradox leads to the downfall of the AMP. And uh, this contra contradictory, contradictory experience of the contradictions of his politics, um, his political alignment did, was kind of contentious. Um, he kind of had a back and forth relationship with Paul Robeson, who was at certain time, uh, certain times, the symbol of resistance in the pages of the AMP. Mm -hmm. But other mm -hmm. times, he, you know, uh, Barnett distanced himself because of Robeson's ties to uh, Moscow, which I guess were damning, uh, certainly mm -hmm. in, in the United States, but for Barnett as well. Uh, or for ropes in, as well in the eyes of Barnett. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about his contentious relationship with Du Bois and uh, Robeson? Because I find that to be a pretty important feature of this history. So what happens is that uh, during the era of Jim Crow, U.S. apartheid, it compels and obliges a certain kind of solidarity uh, in the black community. I mean, for example, oftentimes you have some folks in the black community looking back nostalgically on those days. I, I, I think in a one-sided manner, but what they're looking back nostalgically on is the kind of black unity that it helped yeah. to forge across class lines. Because I know, you know, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri during the Jim Crow era. And my father was a teamster, a truck driver, drove a cement mixer for construction projects. But around the corner was a prominent black doctor. And his children went to school with myself. And then, of course, that helps to undergird how and why it could be that Barnett could be camaraderie with Robeson, Du Bois, and other folks on the organized left during the era of Jim Crow, because there's a sort of common purpose. It's, a, it's akin to what I was suggesting a moment or two ago, when uh, different historical epics, uh, you have certain forces that 
it can fall by the waist when the page is turned to a new historical epic. And in a nutshell, that sums up what happens to Barnett and his relationship with Du Bois and Robeson. That is to say, once the formidable walls of Jim Crow begin to crumble, more opportunities are opened up, at least on the investment side, mm -hmm. for a person like Barnett. It doesn't necessarily uh, bode well for his journalistic enterprise, but it does bode well for his investing ambitions. Whereas for Robeson and Du Bois, it means Du Bois is being handcuffed circa 1951 at the age of 83 put on trial for being an agent of an unnamed foreign power, presumably the Soviet Union, because he was leading a campaign to ban nuclear weapons, which was seen as communist propaganda. Uh, he's acquitted, barely. Robeson, of course, has his passport taken so he can't go overseas. His income plummets from the six figures to the low four figures. Uh, he becomes a pariah. He becomes radioactive. And so if Barnett wants to pursue his investing ambitions, he would best serve his interests by steering clear of ropes and Du Bois and these folks. Part of the problem, of course, is that his investment ambitions extend to Africa, where Kwame Nkrumah is the founding father of independent Ghana, and Nkrumah remains close to Du Bois, Robeson et al. You know that Du Bois moves to Ghana in 1961 and dies there in 1963. Uh, another black intellectual who I write about in my book on Washington, which will be out in a few months, the former Howard University professor, Alpheus Hunton, he winds up moving to West Africa, dies in Zambia about 1970 with the president and founding father, Kenneth Kaunda, weeping at his grave. So there was a contradiction within the contradiction. In other words, Barnett was counseled mightily to steer clear of Robeson Du Bois at all if he wanted to pursue his financial ambitions. But since his financial ambitions extended to Africa, and many of the African leaders and parties were admirers of the left, the Black left in the United States, if he turned their back on these Black leftists, this might hamper his investment ambitions in Africa. That's the contradiction within the contradiction. I mean, for example, in my Southern Africa book, I talk about how Mandela was a staunch admirer of Robeson. As, as were many people uh, all over the world, for example. Uh, so this also suggests why a person like Barnett had to walk a tightrope. Uh, he had to try to curry, curry favor with certain Africans and Black people who are not as enthusiastic about anti-communism, anti-Sovietism. But at the same time, he, he dare not run afoul of the US authorities who were wildly enthusiastic <laughs> generally about anti-communism. So mm -hmm. it puts him in a, in a rather uh, anomalous and tricky position. Right, uh, uh, that pushing and pulling, that needing of Barnett between, uh, I mean, he, he was some sort of, I think you call him a, an unofficial um, secretary of state, um, kind of an unofficial advisor for, I mean, he, he knew people like Kwame Nkrumah, as you're, as you're describing, but he also was friends with uh, Richard Nixon, or he was um, uh, right. some sort of right-hand man at a certain point, maybe for a brief period. So yeah, that does seem like a thin tightrope uh, act to to perform, um, and you characterize that I think really nicely by describing the ANP and Barnett as caught in a spider's web of uh, anti Jim Crow contradictions, mm -hmm. and that's ultimately the paradox of, of Jim Crow. I think that you reference in your title. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have a couple more questions about Barnett. Um, 
and the ANP um, having to do with this paradox, the pressure of the international community, which the ANP, this is a quote, uh, played a preeminent role in generating was an essential corrosive serving to ensure that Jim Crow would lapse into a death spiral from which it could not escape easily. But this led to the paradox, the welcome segregation and unwelcome liquidation of black institutions um, that um, uh, Barnett faced and the ANP faced ultimately. Now, another context for this work is the Bandung Conference. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about the Bandung Conference, its significance in putting international pressure on the United States and, and Jim Crow and linking Jim Crow um, to, to the anti-colonial movement, the anti-Jim Crow to the anti-colonial movement? And why mm -hmm. did Barnett seem to downplay the importance of the conference uh, at a certain point? Mm. You may so have already answered place, that to an extent, but. Yeah, T so it, it takes place in the mid 1950s in Indonesia. Uh, it's oftentimes seen as a precursor of the non-aligned movement. Uh, the movement, as you know, that arises during the Cold War uh, between East and West, so to speak. It features uh, leaders from recently liberated China, hosted by Sukarno of Indonesia, featuring uh, leaders from Africa, and uh, of course, a number of Black Americans wind up in Bandung as well, including Congressman uh, Adam Clayton Powell of Harlem, who is under siege by the US authorities because they don't like his anti-racism. They don't like the fact that he's accumulating seniority that is allowing him to become a powerful member of the House of Representatives. So he decides to pay his dues by uh, going to Bandung and waving the US flag, but that does not save him. And uh, Barnett has a correspondent there because the Black community would be interested. Uh, in Bandung. The problem is that one of his uh, major journalists, Alice Dunnigan, who is their Washington correspondent, she's, as they say nowadays, she's big mad <laughs> about the fact that he doesn't send her. Uh, and then it, it shows what happens as Jim Crow begins to crumble, and she's able, as Jim Crow begins to crumble, to leapfrog to a better position, at least in terms of wages, with the US government, for example. Prior to that, uh, she was notorious because she would go to White House press conferences and would be studiously ignored by the president in terms of waving her hand to ask a question, even though the president oftentimes would call on uh, non-US journalists. That, that, that's part of the polecat status of um, Black Americans, which I guess people still are having trouble wrapping their minds around. And, and, and to come full circle, uh, I don't think it's been fully understood that if you are the enslaved in a slaveholder's republic, and you fight against that slaveholders republic and to come full circle, I think in terms of our opening discussion, the, the problem really isn't with me. The, the problem really is, is a beef with the black community and their choices in the late 18th century because historians have acknowledged for some time that uh, black Americans were not all on board with regard to the revolt against British rule. I mean, uh, there's a, docudrama, which I highly recommend, The Book of Negroes, co-produced by Canadian Broadcasting, South African Broadcasting, and BET in the United States, Black Entertainment Television, which has some very dramatic scenes of the enslaved confronting George Washington, for example. There's recent literature. As I said, <laughs> that's the thing about history. People continue to write new histories because there are new sources that are revealed. It's about George Washington's uh, crusade to track down his escape property, a woman known as Oni Judge, who, I mean, it, it's really almost obsessional and maniacal how he tries to track her down 
after she flees from his from him. And so as the book of Negro suggests uh, that these Negro fleeing to Canada. In fact, Canada oftentimes starts to put black people amongst the border because an, an initial premise of the revolt against British rule was also to seize Canada. And that became uh, an ambition. And uh, I noticed that Tucker Carlson just wondered why the United States is mucking around in Ukraine when you have Canada right next door, for example. Just like the United States ripped off Mexico for uh, Texas and California, for example, number one and two, number two states. So the British used to put Black people alongst the border in communities. So they knew that they would fight to the death to keep the United States from invading because, uh, and, and so I know that, that that goes against, people want to see us all on the same page, which I understand, but, you know, facts are stubborn things. And the, the question is not how to evade history, but how to confront it and, and deal with it and come up with strategies that deal with the contradictions, not to act like the contradictions don't it, exist because it doesn't fit your theory of the case. <laughs> uh, so uh, in any case, uh, Bandung, to return to the threat, uh, represents, uh, in, in some estimates, it represents a revolt of the colored people, the peoples of color. But that, that, that's not altogether accurate because a major participant in Bandung was Yugoslavia. For example, which you know, as you know, had contradictions with uh, Moscow, um, but certainly it represents in its in its bulk, in its disproportion, it did represent a revolt of the communities of color of Asia and Africa in particular, and uh, that's one of the reasons it's attracted so much attention uh, subsequently. Um, and uh, some of that history you just recounted of uh, the, uh, uh, between the uh, alliance between um, American uh, Negroes and um, the British, you can find in your book, Negro Comrades of the Crown. Absolutely. Right. Okay. <laughs> One of my critics says, you, you put a cover of that book <laughs> uh, online, mm -hmm. which has a picture of these black soldiers under the Union Jack. And with his caption, this is why I hate books. <laughs> That's quite a commentary. Yeah. I don't know if you should be saying that in an era where book bans are prevalent. Right. And, <laughs> right? Um, uh, excellent. OK. Um, let's see. I had one other question for you. Oh, yeah. OK. Just a quick, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the legacy of AMP today. Mm. I mean, it falls into uh, desuetude and mm -hmm. what's the shape of the black press after A&P and, and what's the legacy of Barnett more generally today? Well, the black press falls on hard times. Uh, it's difficult to escape, although it's, it's still escape, it's, it still exists because it, it serves a purpose. I mean, uh, I subscribe and have been subscribing to years, for years to the New York Amsterdam News, the Los Angeles Sentinel, and the successor to the Muhammad Speaks, which is the final call, the Nation of Islam newspaper. I don't know if I should admit that. <laughs> Reading choices can be interpreted different ways. But, um, up, and if you look at the New York Amsterdam News uh, out of Harlem, uh, it still has a lot of uh, global coverage. You, it's a tabloid, so you turn the page and that whole second page is usually news from Africa. And then you go into the middle of the newspaper and there's a half page about the Caribbean, usually immigration issues, because of course the black community in New York is heavily, has heavy roots in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Antigua, Barbados, et cetera. So the LA Sentinel, not so much. That is to say, hardly any international coverage, hardly at all, in fact. And I think that that's part of the impact of desegregation, which is one of the reasons why so many young black people look back nostalgically to this era when there were black institutions. But I think what we missed 
is how many on the left did not necessarily understand. Well, to be fair, the left was under siege, you know, Smith Act prosecutions, uh, killings, as in the case of the Black Panther Party. And it's difficult to think clearly when you're dodging bullets. But I think that this decline of Black institutions, the way desegregation played itself out, became a casualty. And I think that many people feel that that was a mistake uh, for these Black institutions to go into demise mm -hmm. as a result of desegregation. And the same holds true for the AMP. I, I think our communities would be better served if we had an AMP today. And I guess that that's really the ultimate legacy of Claude Burnett in the sense that he created an institution who, which leaves a conspicuous gaping hole when it disappears. Yeah, when it gets when the uh, black employment, black journalism gets absorbed into the mainstream for higher wages and so forth, uh, as you recount in your book. Uh, just a quick note here, because um, it came to mind. If anyone out there thinks that Dr. Horn is a royalist, a monarchist, <laughs> uh, go ahead and read his book, Dawning of the Apocalypse. Uh, where he has very colorful uh, uh, descriptions of the pungence, the pungency of uh, of uh, uh, England at, at the time it was an empire, a rising empire. Um, and go ahead and check out his um, uh, his let's call it a, his obsequies for Queen Elizabeth when she right. passed away. Uh, if, and then tell me if uh, if he's a royalist. Yeah, okay, Doctor Horn. This conversation really. It really is. Uh, in closing, Dr. Horn, your book, Revolting Capital, is coming out. When can we expect it to hit shelves? Probably May in Washington, okay. D.C. Right. And that's with international publishers? Yeah. Yeah. And people might want to now go to uh, a search engine and plug in Gil Scott Heron and his song on Washington, D.C. Okay. We'll definitely do that. Uh, and you have a book coming out with a mutual comrade of ours, Chris Steele. Yeah, of exactly. the Time Talks Conversations. podcast. Conversations. Sorry? No, yeah. Uh, just saying he's of the Time Talks podcast. Exactly. And uh, Conversations with Horn. Exactly. Would you any any idea when we can expect that one? Uh, it's hard to say. Maybe in the end of the year. Okay. We'll look forward to those. Dr. Horn, thank you again for your time. I'll be in touch uh, very soon. Thank you and good luck. <laughs>